Well, good morning, and um, we are just a couple minutes away from our start time. If you're watching um, and it's recorded and not live, I want to give you a welcome. Glad you are uh, joining with this study. I hope it's helpful that they're recorded. Um, you know, one of the things I want to encourage people to do is, um, you know, the, the, one of the things that misses out is the opportunity in, when you're in class to, to be able to be in dialogue with people. And, you know, I think one of the benefits of this is that maybe you haven't been doing the Bible study in the past because, it, you know, the day of the week and the time just didn't work with your schedule and you're starting to join with us. And, and the plan will be that we'll continue um, to make videos of our Bible studies together so that if you can't make it during the set time, you could still join with us. But one of the values of being able to do this stuff in person um, or e even in this sort of pseudo in-person thing is the opportunity for feedback, questions, um, wrestling with the text. There are, um, you know, this is a part of coming in and dealing with what we call eschatology, um, the last things, and literally that's what eschatology means, the, the last things, the study of last things, is, um, you know, it, it, there's questions that we have, there's complications, and one of the things that we're, we're doing right now is, is that we've been in Revelation and our focus has been on Revelation. Um, but yeah, when we... When we come in and we and we begin this process of really digging in, studying, trying to understand, we're, we're doing it not in isolation, we're doing it as part of the body of Christ, we're doing it in community. And so um, one of the opportunities that we have, um, it takes a little bit of work, um, it'll always be somewhat limited and provisional, is that we can be in dialogue with Christians through the centuries. That it's not just what am I getting out of this, but but what but is has the church overall? What of different Christians? What of schools of thought that are in the church? And so there's this part where we we study the book of Revelation, but we're standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before, and we see more clearly because they're helping to lift us up, to give us a little bit higher perspective, and. Um, and, and the same sort of thing happens is that we're, we read the book of Revelation, but there's all this other information about what the Bible has to say about the end. And it will impact our reading of Revelation, but then what we're doing is we're, we're synthesizing, we're taking this information. And, you know, when we come to a book like Revelation and we read it for what it is and we, we understand its message, that's the beginning. And then we ask the question, okay, I, I think I have some idea what God was saying to them. Now, what is he saying to me? And this becomes the part of spiritual interpretation. And I say spiritual because one part is we pray, we listen, we, we trust that sometimes the Holy Spirit will, will breathe life into the words and we have this sense of conviction God is speaking. Um, but at the same time, we, we are also... We, we have certain questions. And these are questions that Christians have asked through the centuries, and are, they're, they're questions because this is about our life. What happens when I die? Will I be awake or will I be asleep? I mean, Paul talks about being asleep in the Lord. Will I be, but, you know, I mean, it's a euphemism for death because it, Christian death is different than normal death. What happens um, if, if, you know, if I'm awake, then I go to heaven? And what's resurrection? And why judgment? And why, you know, and it, it, is there two judgments? And why are there two judgments? And, and we start dealing with this information, and we have these sorts of questions. And there's not just one passage that speaks to it, but there's a number of passages, but... Those passages were addressing specific issues, and it has some information to help us. And so, this is the way that we that we do this work of taking the information in, listening to it, listening to how others have interpreted, having these big questions, and then 
allowing all of the information that we have in the Bible to, to, to speak into that question. And, um, you know, and this is where sometimes, you know, there's some things that I can tell you for sure. If you've been born again, if you've confessed that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, when you die, you will go to be with him. I think consciously awake, separated from your body, but your spirit aware of what's going on. Um, I could be wrong on that second part, but the, the majority of Christians through the centuries have taken that view. But what I can be sure about is, is you're going to be with the Lord. But what I can also tell you is, is that if you die before Jesus comes back and you go to be with the Lord, this isn't the end of the story. This is not what, what his salvation is all about. His salvation is about bringing us into a new age, which is on the other side of our resurrection, where we will then live with God forever. And w with some sense of, of really now entering into the eternal state and, and with this great exploration of what will be. So one of the, the better renditions of this as far as Christians making sense of these sorts of things is actually a children's book by C.S. Lewis called The Last Battle, where he talks about this age to come. And he says, you know, everything that we experience in this life, and this language, this life versus the age to come, that's New Testament language. Everything we experience in this life is like the cover, cover and title page of the greatest book that's never been read. This was just the start. And the real adventure is on the other side of resurrection. So those are a few things where there's some things we can say for sure, and then there's some other things where we get into the details, and we have all this information, and they weren't necessarily just trying to answer one specific question. But what we're going to find today is that some of these questions about what happens when we die are going to get answered for us. Um, not the only time it gets answered, but we got some pretty clear answers that Paul gives us as we turn to Thessalonians. So, if, you join, if you've joined with us, I was giving a little bit of an introduction of just this process that we're in, that because we're in Revelation, and because of where we are in Revelation, getting ready to enter into the end of chapter 19, the beginning of chapter 20, and whole schools of thought have been built up about trying to answer this question of what do we do and make sense of this thousand-year period that Revelation talks about, um, if you're doing any reading on this, uh, which is wonderful, um, in, in advance, is, or you know, you're kind of reading up as we're talking about these things, um, you get into the history of it, that thousand year period, the Greek word for that is child, and so childism is the thousand years, and you'll find ancient, more you know, like ancient writers, and you'll hear this discussion of childism. Um, in our day, we tend to talk with the language of millennium, and so um, millennium is coming out of Latin, and it means a thousand, and so a thousand years, and it's again this reference. And, and this millennium has created different schools of thought about how we think about all that the Bible has to say about the end. And, and, and so we come into to Revelation, we're going to try to understand what, what John was, was speaking and, and writing and giving... Um, and really taking what Jesus had shown him and delivering it to the original audience and what, what we think this meant to them. And then we're going to sit back and go, okay, and what does it mean for us? And, um, but we're not, and as we do that, we're going to do it in light of all the history of what's gone before of how people have interpreted these things. And so, I'm kind of expanding this study out and giving a lot of information here because there's just so much of, well, if I talk about premillennialism, by the end of this study, I'm hoping you will have a very clear understanding of exactly, oh, well, premillennialism is the idea that Jesus comes back before the thousand-year reign, and that thousand-year reign, there's two basic schools or two camps of thought about that. There's historic premillennialism and there is dispensational premillennialism, and you may not remember all the names, 
but you'll have some idea of, oh yeah, there's this school, and there's kind of two camps in this school, and then there's the other school that says that the, 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 the period of a thousand years that's being described in Revelation happens before Jesus comes back, and so then that period is, this trans, is part of the transition between his first coming and his second coming, and in there you kind of have three different schools of thought, and, um, and, and you'll have all of that So that when you read this, you'll realize, okay, there's been different ways that Christians have interpreted this, and, and it leads to some different stories and then different expectations. And, and what we're doing is we're first looking at the raw data. We looked at the Olivet Discourse, and now, and, and, and those were Jesus' clearest words on explaining about when the temple's going to get destroyed and when he's going to come back. Now, let me pray for us, and then I'll talk about a little bit of Thessalonians to you and why we're studying. Loving Father, thank you for this morning, and pray your blessings over us um, as we have the opportunity uh, to begin to um, listen to Paul's words to the Thess Thessalonian church. Pray your blessings over us, and as we not only listen to the words of comfort and encouragement that Paul gave to them, may you speak into our hearts today. Um, may we realize truly that we do not grieve like the rest of people because we have hope in you. And it changes the way that we understand death, especially for those who have died in the Lord. So bless us today, and in Jesus' name, amen. So why are we turning... Question. Question from last uh, Monday. Sure, question from last Monday. Vicki Ravely, if the temple is restored, wouldn't that necessitate God again living in the Holy of Holies? Mm -hmm. If the temple is restored by men's efforts, not God's, then God would not reside there. I've been pre-trib because the Holy Spirit will be, is withdrawn which could mean God could again live in the Holy of Holies to directly minister to the Jews again. So s some questions about, um, you know, if the temple gets rebuilt and then, and then, and then looking at it through the lens of the pre-tribulation, which has to do with in part why we're dealing with, with Thessalonians and building all of this understanding of end time stuff. And, um, one of the things to know is, is that um, the, the pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib has to do with one school of thought in one camp when it comes to these questions about the millennium and, um, uh, and then the rapture. And, um, and, I, and my hope will be that by the end of the study today, we'll have a little bit more information of saying there's this idea of the rapture has been built up in this one school. And, um, but it's kind of moving forward, taking all the other things from scripture and, and, and trying to work this in based on those sorts of things. And it's kind of missing the point in Paul's main point here. And, and we first want to say, what was Paul saying to them? And it, and it may be, that the dispensational, premillennialist, pre-tribulation um, approach could be true, um, but within some of that structure, I I've got some problems. Um, I don't think that we're going to be going back to a temple where God's Spirit dwells in a physical building because the overall trajectory had, was never the idea of God dwelling in a building but the idea of God dwelling in us as image bearers and so when we look at the story of things of the progression the the earthly temple which which became a permanent spot that began with the tent of meeting which has trajectory of God having that 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 intention of moving from the tent where they wandered to this place on Mount Zion where he would reside 
to then authorizing Solomon to build a temple. All of that seems to be heading in the right direction. But, but in the end, what we realize is, is that the, the goal was never a building where God dwelt, but in every human being who is an image bearer. And that's what happens for us who are followers of Jesus. And so, within the, dispens within the dispensational school, and I'll just give you a short answer now, they have a certain presupposition that shapes their reading, and what it ends up doing is this. It ends up causing the Old Testament to determine how we interpret the New Testament. My own tendency is to say, I think that's backwards. I think, you know, this is evangelical, orthodox Christianity, by and large, has taken this approach, which is we believe in what's called progressive revelation. Um, Jumping off from the book of Hebrews, in former times and in a sundry of manners, God spoke to us through angels and visions and prophecies and dreams. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. The idea being is, is that with Jesus, we have greater clarity about the truth than what we had before. And, 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 and you find that trajectory so that when you go back into the Old Testament and you hear about death and the afterlife, and you get this kind of this shadowy concept of Sheol, which is the basic description of the Old Testament about what happens after you die. It doesn't look all bright and cheery. There's some little strands that seem to be pointing that those who die in the Lord are going to be with him and they have a little bit better destiny. But Sheol's kind of gloomy. Get into the New Testament, and you got a much sharper picture about what to expect. Two different trajectories about an intermediate state of what happens between his first coming and second coming, where you die, you're separated. Um, you know, Jesus will tell a parable, Abraham's bosom, you go up. Those who are, who are with Jesus, who believe in Jesus, are with Jesus experiencing uh, a spiritual paradise. Those who aren't are separated by a great chasm and it's suffering. Um, and, and, and then we know they're waiting for Jesus' second coming, resurrection, final judgment. So there's progression. We have more. And the, and the overall principle is, is that we interpret the Old Testament through the New Testament. And so now that we look back at the Old Testament through Christ, we see how a lot of the Old Testament was a prefigurement, and there could have been partial fulfillments of some prophecy. But some of those prophecies that had partial fulfillment, like in Isaiah 40 through 55, which is talking about the promise of, of the return from exile. And there was a return from exile underneath the Babylonians because of the Persian takeover, but that whole thing finds greater fulfillment and it's really talking about the suffering servant. And it wasn't just talking about the exile into Babylon, but it was talking about the exile into the kingdom of darkness and the Son of God coming and delivering us out into the kingdom of light. So you, you have that New Testament going back and shedding light on the Old Testament because we see more, we have more, we understand more. And, and dispensationalism turns this on its head. Dispensationalism has this battling against the thing, and we'll talk more about this later, but dispensationalism is sitting there saying, no, 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 the way God has to fulfill every promise that he gave in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel. And therefore... Everything from Ezekiel's temple and all of those things, they have to be fulfilled. So there's got to be a rebuilding of the temple. And then there's got to be a doing of sacrifices. And, and that's, and we'll talk more, but that's, that's what happens there. Um, and so I'll listen to it. I'll humbly sit there and say, maybe it, it could happen that way. But fundamentally, I, 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 I'm, I'm not convinced because I think that there's presuppositions in their reading that get in the way of listening to, the I think, the broader vision of the New Testament. So, it's, it's possible that a temp, the temple could be rebuilt, that sacrifices could restart, um, I, I, you know. But, I, but, I'm not, I, but what I would caution against is to say, there's no possible way Jesus can come back until those things happen. And, um, and then for the rest of this, let me give you more information for everybody hearing, and we'll 
we'll, we'll, we'll expand out our understanding of these different stories about how to make sense of the millennium tribulation, um, the great tribulation, and all of that. Um, so we're coming into um, Thessalonians. And one of the things I want to do in all of this is I'm trying to teach us how to be good students of the Bible. And one of the things when you're studying Paul's letters is when possible, and, and in many instances it's possible, you kind of want to understand what is, you know, what can I, what can I know about this church that Paul is writing to? And we have a history of the early church that is scripture, the book of Acts. And it follows Paul on his missionary journeys, and we know something of some of his experiences with the churches that he wrote letters to. And this is the case um, with Thessalonica. And, um, and so what we have here is um, Paul um, in Acts 17 is... Um, this is a missionary journey where he thought he was going to go to Asia Minor, and instead God gave him a vision, the Holy Spirit did, of a man in Macedonia calling him to come over to Europe. And Paul follows that. And, um, you know, Paul goes to Philippi, and, and you know, and then he's heading towards um, Greece, and... Um, he gets thrown into prison, and then they have to flee um, from Philippi, and um, and and so in seventeen, this is after they've been in Philippi, um, they're on the road, they've been thrown in prison, but people have come to faith, and they end up going to Thessalonica. When they pass through and Philippus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Great irony, great tragedy, um, came first to the Jews, um, but then the gospel goes out to the Gentiles. He came to that which was his own, John tells us, but his own did not receive him, but to all who received him he gave the right to become children of God. And you see the hardening of the Jews. And you see here where because of their hatred and despising of Christ, they're going after Christ's followers, which seems really being played by the devil, right? especially after reading Revelation. Can't get Christ, so I'm going to go after those that he loves. And then they're sitting there, and they're declaring that Caesar is king. And, um, and they're denying uh, the true king in place of Caesar so that they can attack. Um, when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil, then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Now, that's what we found out. We were not now. We know that for three weeks Paul was preaching to the Jews in the synagogue. We don't really, and this is the part where we're getting a condensed story. Um, you know that. Remember that you're limited by scroll length and and. Luke has a, has a goal in telling this story. Um, what Jesus promised is getting fulfilled. And the life of Jesus is getting worked out through his people, the church. And so from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, the gospel is going forward. And the very same things that Jesus did, 
now his followers are doing in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're going out and they're bringing the kingdom of God. And demons are being cast out. The dead are being raised. The blind are being given sight. These are all signs of the coming of the kingdom of God. And people are hearing the gospel and they are responding and they're being saved. But there is persecution. There is thalipsis. There is pressure. And, um, and, and, and it ends with Paul in prison waiting to declare the gospel before Caesar himself. And, and Luke wants to get there partially, because that's probably about what's going on when he's writing at this time. And, um, and, and to see how far, in a, you know, really a few short years, just a few decades, it has gone from Christ being crucified to the gospel being proclaimed uh, in the capital, in the court of Caesar himself. And so, so in that, Luke's giving us information, but he doesn't give us all the information. And He's got to fit it all in a scroll that can only be about 33 feet long. And, and this is about as big as you can, this axe is about as long as you can get to fill up a 33 foot long scroll. So we don't get all the information there's condensing, but what we do see is the opposition of the Jews, that the church is being formed. Um, some Jews, mostly Greeks, Jason is a Greek name, um, he, probably it, now part of it he's known people knew who he was that when this is getting written Jason and the other brothers and sisters and they know who Jason is and it's probably at this point a, you know a pastor a church leader the house that one of the church houses is meeting in his house he gets arrested um, Paul and Silas leave um, and then this is where we come into this letter of of the Thessalonians. We have 1 Thessalonians, we have 2 Thessalonians. And what we find out is, is that um, one of Paul's companions, maybe two, but definitely Timothy, um, stayed behind for a time and helped the church get established. Um, so well, Paul, and, Paul and Silas had to keep moving, but Timothy stayed behind. And, um, and so Timothy's there, and, and we're not sure, but we kind of have this clue. Um, it, it's possible that they, they wrote a letter and Timothy came and delivered the letter to them because they had some questions. It's possible they didn't write any letter. We don't have the if they did. But one of the things that happens in Thessalonica is that it's very clear that Paul is responding to some of their questions. And the way that he responds to their questions is the very same language of how he responds to the Corinthians when the Corinthians wrote him a letter and then he responded to the questions from their letter point by point. They have some questions, and it comes to Paul. Now the question is, and you know, it's not, it's not super important, but it is helpful. One of the things to know is that um, we're reading through Acts, and it is possible that Thessalonians is written after Berea and by the time that Paul gets to Athens. It's also possible that it happens after Athens and when Paul is in Corinth. And those are the two major theories out there. And most think that the Corinth part is probably the more likely. Now, what's interesting about that is, is that this is all in this missionary journey. And we know that Paul stayed in Corinth for about 18 months. And we also know when. That he arrived sometime late 49, early 50, and he was there for about a year and a half. And so, 1 Thessalonians, and possibly 2 Thessalonians, were most likely written right around 50 AD, which makes Thessalonians perhaps the earliest letter in the New Testament, which would be the first, which would probably be the very first thing that's inspired in the New Testament as far as when it was written. Questions? How do you know when it was written and how long it was in Corinth? So the question becomes, how do I know when it was written and, um, and how long he was in Corinth? So part of that comes from the evidence of reading Acts as well as reading through First and Second Corinthians and, and just reading through those things where you're trying to pay attention of building the timelines. Now, what happens is, is that... Um, and, and then there was a, it was a two-part question. So... Paul was in Thessalonica, 
he established the church, and and then Timothy comes back. And when we're piecing this together, what makes the most sense of all of this based upon Acts is that this is it's in this missionary journey. Um, and and so we're 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 placing this, you know, there there's other letters that we we put later on. We typically call, you know, like Philippians, Galatians, Colossians. We know Philippians, Paul was writing in chains. And while there's a couple different periods where he was in prison, the one that makes the most sense is the Roman imprisonment because he was in he was in Rome when he was writing Philippians. And then we date that and we go, well, that was more like 63 because we, built on tradition and the best evidence that we have, Paul was probably sent to Rome facing trial 62, 63 AD. Now, we're, we're listening to Acts. We're, we're, we have some data on how Paul's missionary journeys went. We know that he was in Athens, and then, and then he went to Corinth. And this is about the church getting founded, and then, and then Timothy coming um, to Paul, and, and we're get, given information that Timothy comes back. Um, Corinth is a good likelihood because he was there for about 18 months. Um, it means that the church... It is a young church, you know, it's probably been together for, you know, we don't know how long he was in Thessalonica, you know, we know at least three weeks, but it could have been three months. And then he was in Berea for a time. And, and, and this is the part where there's a little bit of, you know, where we're, we're, we just have to be humble and we just have to, you know, not, like not, not put too much weight on these things, but we have a basic timeline. Now, how do I know the timeline as far as the date for Corinth. Um, while Paul was in Corinth doing the ministry, a new proconsul was assigned to Corinth whose name was Gallio, and Gallio Paul preached to and met with, and we're told about that. And we know from extra biblical sources when Gallio was sent to um, to Corinth, which was 51 AD. So that becomes one of our anchor points where when we start piecing together the story of Acts, we sit there and we go, okay, Paul was predates Gallio. Gallio gets there at the beginning of 51. So Paul's there in 50 and depending how long that goes. And so probably 50, 51, Paul's there. Could be early as 49. People have their different theories. Everybody wants to write their doctorates and then come up with their theories and you got to write something new. So that might be it. But you're there. And, and, and so we know this is happening early on. Now, the other thing that happens with Thessalonians is um, one, of, one of the occasions, one of the questions that they had, and, and this makes sense for a fledgling church, is um, they've heard the gospel. Um, Jesus was crucified for our sins. You've been reconciled to God. You've been set free from sin, Satan, and death. And then what happens is, is that we know Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. And then there's some believers who've confessed Jesus, and they died. And the believers are sitting there and going, well, what happened to them? I, I didn't think we were going to die. And, and so Paul has to write back to them to help them understand, okay, we don't know exactly when he's coming back. And so it's altogether possible that there's going to be believers who end up physically dying. But we don't grieve the same way because even though the physical body may perish, we have this hope of resurrection. And so Thessalonians is about that. And, 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 and what he writes, and this is in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is he's dealing with that specific issue. Now, God's word to us was, first of all, God's word to them. From this passage, you have, you have dispensational premillennialists who have built the entire concept of the rapture from this passage. But this passage isn't really trying to spend a whole bunch of time to give us an expectation about a rapture, and we'll get into that. What it's really trying to do is to give comfort so that you understand that those who die before the Lord's coming are still with Jesus 
and they're going to be resurrected and you don't have to worry um, for them in the same way that you worry for other people when they die and they're separated from the Lord. Um, so, it has, a, it has some more issues, but that's one of the main issues. And, and that's a little bit of our background. Okay, so we know it's a Jewish-Gentile church, more, more Gentiles than Jews, but some Jews. Um, it's a young church. Um, they've heard the gospel. Paul was with them for a time. Timothy gets left behind, and very naturally, they have some questions. And one of their questions, which we're going to read the answer to, is, well, why is it that some of the believers have died? Are they safe? Are they okay? I didn't think we were going to die. Um, okay, First Thessalonians. Chapter 4, um, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Now, um, uh, later NIV translation who talks about um, falling asleep in death in the Lord as a way of trying to, to make sense of this. This is, um, this is a euphemism. Paul is, is, is speaking, and he's trying to use special language, talking about Christians dying, um, to say that their death is different. Um, and it, it probably has this implication to it. Um, when you sleep, your body is at rest, but your mind is still active. You may not always remember what you were what you were dreaming about but but there is still this consciousness while your body is at rest um, when you die your body goes into grave but your but your soul your consciousness your is awake and what Paul is saying here is is and and you are with the Lord um, now what he originally says is, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. I don't want you to, I don't want you to be ignorant about believers who die before Jesus' second coming. And I don't want you to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Now, he's not saying don't grieve. That would be a bad understanding of this translation. What he's saying is, is I don't want you to grieve in the same way as if you don't have hope for these people. Um, it's sad when our friends are, are separated. There, there is a wrongness to death. And what Paul is just sitting here and he's trying to give encouragement is to say, it's going to be okay, guys. Yes, they fell, they, they, they died. They, they fell asleep in the Lord. But we have hope in resurrection. And just because they die doesn't mean they're not going to be resurrected. You don't have to be alive to be resurrected when the Lord returns. If you've already fallen asleep, it's all going to work out. And Paul will end up elaborating on this and giving us some details about understanding how the, the Lord's coming will be. Now, one of the things with this, and this is the advantage for us of, you know, focusing our attention here on last things, going back, and we, we studied the Olivet Discourse, and that's still hopefully fresh in our minds, because you're going to hear some language that Paul uses in this passage, and it's going to be very reminiscent of what we heard Jesus say, and in fact, Jesus is quoting the, the Jesus tradition here. He's intentionally echoing that language of saying, this, this is what the Lord's told us. It, it's built upon this Olivet Discourse as well for Paul on his understanding of the Old Testament. So, verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Um, now, there's, there's some interesting things that go on here. Um, and this is the part that becomes helpful where, you know, you, 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 you become a specialist in, in studying Paul. You know, you, you read all of his letters and you pay attention to a bunch of stuff. And... Um, you may not be aware of this, but it is very rare in Paul where he just uses Jesus by the name Jesus by himself. Usually it's Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus or the Lord. Um, and um, 
You know, and so you read that and go, huh. Now, probably part of this is, is about the intimacy of just these people who are dead are with Jesus. Everything's okay. And they're going to come back and be with Jesus. And you, and you also get this as far as with Paul. You get this Trinitarian structure of things where you have God, and, and this is referring to God the Father and Jesus, and they're being distinguished. And, 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 and both are active agents in our salvation. God initiates, and he initiates, and it's going to be done through the power and work of Jesus, as well as through the power and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, we believe Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe, because Jesus was the first fruits of resurrection, but there's going to be more to come, God will bring with Jesus those who have now fallen asleep in him. And probably the better way of understanding this, this is a little bit of a confusing passage even in the Greek, is to say God the Father is going to bring those who have fallen asleep in him, Jesus, they're going to come back when he comes back. Um, according to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Um, so this is where we start to get into this stuff where we, we go back to the Olivet Discourse and Jesus talks about his second coming and about coming in the clouds and, and those who are with him. And there's going to be trumpets and there's going to be a call and Paul's going to have some of that language here. And um, we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep we're not going to be resurrected first. We're not going to, they're not going to be left behind. And I'm really not trying to make an allusion to that fictional series of books that were end time books. Um, they're all part of this. That This is all working out of what God wants it to be. So here's how it's going to go. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. Now, there, there's something that goes on here. Uh, I'll read it for you and then I'll give you explanation. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Now, we read this and, we, and, and, and the structure of it is such that we kind of read it successfully saying it's, it'll be this and then it'll be this and then it'll be this. Here's this list. In Greek, the structure here doesn't support that sort of a reading. Um, because typically in Greek, when you want to make lists like that, you go, um, it, it would literally read, read like this. The Lord will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call. And the and is like the comma and then the final and, and that means this, this, and this. One, two, three, these three separate things. In this one, you don't get the ands. You only have one and. And so the way that you would read it is really more like this. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. The loud command is two parts. It gets, it gets experienced in this way. The voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, that's the loud command. Um, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. Um, oh, wait, I, I skipped, sorry. Trumpet call and the dead in Christ will rise first. Um, Probably something like this. This isn't now. One of the things that ends up happening here is is that people are trying to make sense of this with a whole bunch of other passages and and things being said and the the millennial, and then you start getting into not just 
Christ's resurrection and then everybody else being resurrected, but you get into these separate resurrections. And here's a resurrection, and another resurrection will happen later. Um, and um, here, the, the focus isn't trying to give all of that. He's, he's trying to give comfort to them about understanding what happens to those who've died in the Lord. And the first thing is, is that those who are dead in the Lord with Jesus will be resurrected at this point when Jesus is coming with a loud command. And probably a good point as far as maybe even clarifying a little bit of language of the New Testament. I've talked about this before. Right now, you and I are living in the last days. Um, the last days are, are, began with the proclamation of the kingdom. Um, was proven through the resurrection, because resurrection is, is, is an end-time event sort of a thing. But only one person got resurrected. And then we realize that, that this work of salvation is a two-part thing. His first coming and his second coming. And in between those is the gospel is going out so that as many people who can be saved will be saved. And this entire period of time, and I know it's taken 2,000 years, and just a little while longer... 2,000 years is, feels like more than a little while, but a day in the Lord is like a 1,000 years, so we'll, 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 we'll give the Lord benefit of the doubt. But these are the last days. And then you have this language, the last day, which also gets repeated in the day of the Lord. And that last day is this, the day that he comes the day that finally everything gets consummated. Now, there's question marks about how all that works out, but, but, but this is focusing on that. And those who've already died, they'll be raised with him. The first matter, the first thing in the series of events is they're going to be raised with him in the clouds, and then we, who are still alive, are going to be caught up with him. Now, oh, um, a little background you, you may not know it but some of the language here is is coming out of the Psalms and um, in particular Psalm 47 Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. Remember the backdrop? Paul, Paul is, is familiar. He, got, he had to be shuffled out of town. They're raising a disturbance, and they're claiming somebody else is king other than Caesar. Yeah, you, you bet I am, because Caesar isn't the one true king. Um, and, um, and, you know, how sad it is when, when those who have been given the promises of the covenant and by blood are descendants of Abraham are denying the reality of all that we pray and all that we're taught in the Old Testament. But this is our salvation. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord, amid the sounding of trumpets. You hear the sounding of trumpets? Remember we get the trumpets in Revelation? Uh, the, the, the trumpets, the, the announcement of God's coming. There's language here of the theophany going back to Exodus. This is what it feels like. This is what it looks like when the Lord comes. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises to for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm or a praise. God reigns over the nations. He's seated on his holy throne. The, noble nation, the nobles of the nations assemble as the people of God of Abraham. For the king of kings belongs to God. He is greatly exalted. And, um, and this is an enthronement psalm. This is God now sitting in the seat of authority and everybody recognizing him for who he is and giving him the glory that is his due, and it's amid trumpets and sounds. And that idea is one of the ideas of the day of the Lord. He takes possession. He sits enthroned. 
he becomes king on earth as it is in heaven. So Paul has some of that picture and imagery of what's happening on this day. And this is where I've talked about this before. And going back to the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is picturing something as well. There, you know, there's a reference as far as we go back to the beginning of the book of Acts, and Jesus gets ascended, and they're looking up, and he's taken into the clouds, and, they, and, and, and then there's a couple of angelic witnesses, and they tell them the very way that Jesus ascended and went to sit on the throne in heaven is the way that he will ultimately descend. If we want to go back and we want to get more of this, we would again be studying the book of Daniel. We'd see the story of the Son of Man who's coming and he's descending on the clouds and he is taking possession of the earth. And, and this is what's getting pictured on the day of the Lord. And this is the picture that we have in, Thess in Thessalonians chapter 4. And i got to skip back forward to Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And this is the main thing that Paul's getting at, is, is don't worry about those there is the, the first order of things, they're going to be coming from heaven with Christ as he takes, and they're going to be resurrected, and then we're going to be caught up, and then we, we hear about this in a later, in a flash, and in, uh, in, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be transformed. Now, and, so the, and, and then we won't have to actually literally die. We'll be transposed from these mortal bodies into resurrection bodies um, as we're getting this picture unfolded to us. Now, there's more information. This information is partial. Some people take that information and then they start to separate out and they say, well, there's this resurrection and there's going to be another resurrection. And, and we'll talk more about that. But what we begin with is, what did Paul say to them? And this is primarily about comforting them, about answering the question, what about those? I mean, are they okay? What happened? I didn't think we were going to die. Um, now, there's more. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Sound familiar? All of the discourse, Paul here, he's taught them these things. This is part of discipleship. This is important stuff. This is why the all of it discourse is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We need to know this information. Um, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. Now, usually I sit there and I say brothers and sisters because it's speaking to both men and women. Here, I only said sons, not because I'm not including women, but I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally wanting to teach you something. And that is, is that you see only sons could receive the inheritance in the Greco-Roman world. And you see all of us, brothers and sisters, we are all going to receive the inheritance of being children of light um, and children of the day. Um, we belong to the family. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, The entire idea of the rapture, which we'll end up talking about, comes from here. But you really wouldn't get that idea if you were just reading this. It doesn't mean that the, the idea of the rapture is wrong, but the idea does not jump out at the page of you. And, and, and if you don't know exactly what the rapture means, the rapture means, within a certain story of how all of this stuff works out, so, 
before Jesus comes back and sets up the millennial kingdom, there's going to be this period of great tribulation, which is going to be seven years long. And he's going to come, and he is going to draw all of his people up into the clouds with him um, as he waits to take possession of the earth. Some people believe that those who are still alive, who believe in the Lord, will be caught up into the clouds with Jesus, with those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, and at the beginning of the tribulation of that seven years, and there'll be seven years of, this, of things going really bad on the earth, and no church Christian presence while that's happening, and they're going to be up in the clouds with Jesus. The second idea is the mid-trib, we're halfway through it, three and a half years before it goes really, really bad. And, and, and this is coming out of Daniel, and, 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 and this is prophecy, and this is where I've talked that, you know, we're, we're reading through Revelation, we're seeing these things unfold, and things progressively seem to get worse, and we have some expectation, and we know we have the book of Daniel, and there may be this sense that this literal, there may be a literal seven-year period of great tribulation. In the in the dispensational premillennialist, where Christ comes back before the millennial kingdom in Revelation, the mid-trib says, halfway through, he then takes all of the believers out. And this, the, the mid-trib view tends to be, I think, I think the Left Behind series is basically presenting that sort of a picture of things, where Jesus comes back before the millennium, he, he raptures and draws believers up into the clouds with him for th in the middle of three and a half years. And then he descends, and then he sets up his millennial kingdom. And then some of the people who are saints who martyred and then live on earth with him along with Jews. And the, you get into some different theories, and we'll talk more about this. And then the final one that, again, looks at this and calls this the rapture sits there and says that it's a post-trib where it, at the end of the seven years this all happens and then the millennial starts. And, and in that, they're very much like historic premillennialists who believe that Jesus comes back before he sets up with the millennial kingdom. And then they very obviously believe that what Paul is saying here in Thessalonians. Now, the other camp says the, the millennium happens before Jesus' second coming. And, and when the millennium period is done, and we'll talk about that, then you see this unfolding, and this is the day of the Lord, and you've got this final trumpet, and you've got this loud command, and the king is coming, and he's getting enthroned on earth, and we're going to move from this fallen age into the age to come. And um, while I, I read Thessalonians, and, and to me most straightforwardly, it, it lends towards that idea the, that this is all kind of getting wrapped up. This is the day of the Lord. The overall idea of it is when the Lord takes possession, he takes possession with his heavenly host. And you and I are part of that heavenly host. We are involved in the spiritual battle. We have a part to play. And when he takes possession, he's going to lead the way, and we're going to be in that procession, and we will be part of the triumphant, the triumphant um, people of God who now um, will see our king enthroned over the earth. Um, now, we're not done yet with Thessalonians because Paul sent this letter and he gave them this comfort. And then he said, you know about the day and the hour that nobody knows it. Just it's, And it's going to be like a thief in the night. Um, but you and I, we're not going to fall asleep. We're going to be watchful. Um, they had some more questions. And so in 2 Thessalonians, we get a little bit more information. It's not so much information. It's not about the rapture, which it's called the rapture, about this meeting Jesus up in the clouds, but it's about trying to get a little more information about the timing 
and Paul introduces this language of the man of lawlessness. So we are now at 9:58, and um, do we did we have any more questions? No. Um, and so we will start with Second Thessalonians when we come back. If you have any questions, sit in this. You know, if if I if I spark something of some past things and you want to feel free to ask these questions we'll come back and um, we'll deal with second thessalonians and then we'll we'll start to tell the story about these different schools of thought and um, you know what i'm trying to do is to continually repeat some of this language so it becomes familiar so that you're getting handles to go okay there's the premillennialist and they're in, they're in one school of thought, and there's kind of two camps. Um, and these are the ones that say Jesus' second coming happens before the thousand-year kingdom that gets described in Revelation. And then there are those who are basically in some way post-millennialists. There's two different... There's actually three different camps of this. Um, which is to say that the, the period of time whether it's an actual thousand years or whether it's more of a symbol, is really referring to a period of time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And, and the stuff of the millennium happens before Jesus' second coming. And, um, and so we're going we're gonna to get into that next week. Um, let me pray for us as we go. Lord, thank you for this encouragement that you give us through Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. May we hear those words to us. We have reason for hope in the face of death. Death is sad, it's tragic, it's not the way things are supposed to be. And those who die in the Lord, they do not die like the rest of people. We, when we die, we go to be with you. And if we've died in you, we will surely rise with you. And so, Lord, may we not grieve like the rest of people, especially as we consider those who are in you. May our hope, may our trust, and may our understanding that you've given us in your word give us a solid foundation to not live in great fear but in great faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless.